So everyone who's just tuning in, our speaker Betsy Marsh for 3 p.m. should be with us momentarily. She's having internet issues at her location. I'm sure we all can appreciate the challenge with that. Um, but Sherry's in contact with her and she should be joining us momentarily. I could go ahead and do uh, the announcements and Betsy's introduction. We could, we could go ahead and do the polls too, Sherry, if you'd like to start with whatever you'd like to start with. You just well, we'll wait a little bit on the polls because some, well, we'll see how, uh, how long it takes Betsy to join us because sometimes I know folks are not able to get in right when we're starting. Sure. So, but um, Betsy works for Tarrant Regional Water District and she, her name was actually given to me by uh, Tony Moorhead. Uh, Betsy is a, a Tarrant County Master Gardener as is Tony. So we're pleased to have you all visiting and speaking with us today. Um, Betsy grew up camping in, in Texas State Parks and so from and admired and loved native plants when she was doing this activity. So since a young age, she they've just had her heart. So she's going to talk to us today with an emphasis on native plants. And she's been gardening herself with native plants for about over a decade. She went to the University of Texas at Austin and later to the University of Michigan and she received a Master of Science in Natural resource policy and behavior. She does program coordination for, um, she's done it for nonprofits and other groups. And she currently works with the Tarrant Regional Water District. And she's going to talk a little bit about what they do, because I think that's important, especially in North Texas, as our population increases. We, you know, I think as gardeners, we don't take our water for granted, especially on our own um, garden spots. But it's, it's good to know the big picture and understand um, what's being done to help uh, with water conservation on a larger scale. Uh, Betsy has worked for the City of Grapevine Parks and Recreation Department, and she's helped with schools create native plant gardens and managed habitat restoration efforts and promotes biodiversity research. And you can visit the Tarrant Regional Water District, trwd.com, to find more about um, what they do and her role there. Um, at the bottom of her, so Betsy's talk is gardens that give back, lovely, low water, life-giving landscapes. And so two of our giveaways to go with this talk are three $25 e-gift cards from Painted Flower Farm. Those will be emailed to you. And uh, so ha hands-free, but you can go, uh, uh, go buy plants at their facility there in Denton. And uh, we're giving away three rain barrels. The rain barrels have a screen and a spigot. So uh, it, the other components to assemble it, you know, a riser and a connector for the gutter will be need to be provided by, by whoever wins the barrel. But we have these really nice rain barrels. Let me tell you, it's hard to find rain barrels in fall because all the big push is to sell them in the springtime. So, uh, but we have these uh, wood grain, you know, type uh, barrels, they're flat on the back, so they'll, they'll rest against the side of a building or a shed. We have a brass bigot, and uh, they're awesome. It's going to be hard to give them away. They've been, someone said it was like Christmas in my house. I kept getting all these big packages, and plus, but they'll be happy. To, <laughs> they've, been, they've been stored, and we're ready to pick some winners at the end of our talk and deliver those. So I'm excited to give away. All these uh, items are excellent. Yeah, and while everybody is waiting, and um, if you just tuned in, our 3 p.m. speaker, Betsy Marsh, is having a few technological issues with her internet, so she should be joining us shortly. But I did want to invite you to go to our website, dcmga.com, to our special events, upcoming events, and here's Betsy right on cue. So as she's getting settled, I wanted to invite you to go to our dcmga.com website where you can find out information about our upcoming events, including our monthly meetings, which are held the second Wednesday of every month and they're free, open to the public. And for the October 14th meeting, we're welcoming the Dallas Arboretum, Nancy Nance and Jim Apkin who are going to present on what's going on with the plant trials there. So Sherry, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and, and Betsy and let y'all get settled in. Okay, well, thank you. It's good to see you here, Betsy. 
we'll get you uh, going here in just a little bit. Have we given uh, Betsy, um, I guess, admin, not admin, but I'll stop my screen here. Just Thank added you. her. We just made you a co-host, Betsy. <laughs> Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Welcome. Thank you. I'm sorry for the technical hiccups. I had to uh, switch locations and computers and things like that, but... Oh, my. I know. Uh, we did an introduction and have done our spill. We're all set for you to go. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, let me get my bearings here, make sure I can see you guys and share my screen and everything like that. Okay. All right, do you guys see the, um, the plants, the opening slideshow picture? We sure do, Betsy, and it looks lovely. Okay, super. All right, and let me, make, let me move you guys over a little bit so I can see you as well on here. Um, whoops. Let's and he's see. a cutie too. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to, um, make it so that I can see you guys also. And I'm not quite sure if I'm going to be able to achieve that. So I, um, I have found with my PowerPoint presentation, I have to choose in that under the slide settings to view as an individual browser rather than share my whole screen. Okay. Let's and see. you're welcome to X back out and try to do that if you'd like, because I know it's a little discombobulating to talk to a vortex. <laughs> yeah, and I want to make sure too that I can see the chat later. Um, let's see here. So I will um, stop screen sharing for just a second. And then um, what did you recommend that I do? Um, if So if you go to your PowerPoint presentation, okay. let me pull mine up so I'm knowing what I'm telling you here. And you go to the top toolbar that says slideshow. There's something that says set up slideshow. Mm -hmm. And when you choose that, if you, uh, for the type, pick browsed by an individual window rather than presented by a speaker full screen. I do have that selected. Oh, you do? Okay. Yes. Super. Okay. All right. So I think I solved the problem. I put the Zoom, folk, your, um, the Zoom window over on another monitor okay so i'm going to try to share the screen one more time and as betsy, right. betsy should get started we do have a, a handful of people that will assist in monitoring the chat so we can help you with those questions at the end of your talk okay perfect all right do you guys see the uh, first slide again we do looks great okay. super okay thanks everybody oh take a deep breath right um i'm really happy to be with you all here today um, like many of you, I've been staying at home uh, for much of the last many months and doing my best to take care of my family and keep everybody safe. And I've missed seeing people and it's great to have a chance to connect with you all today. So thank you for this opportunity. Today, I'd like to talk with you about three things that are very important to me and they're all connected. And one is why you and your gardens are so important. And the next thing is why water is worth talking about. And the third thing is some remarkable native plants that I think would make your garden even more beautiful and life-giving than it probably is already. So um, let's talk about the first um, topic, why you and your gardens are so needed. Well, over the years, I've interacted with lots of different people and worked in lots of different gardens. And um, I have noticed, unfortunately, some folks don't place as much value on gardens as I do. And I have noticed that they see things, sometimes gardens as being something extra, um, something that's nice for people to enjoy, but generally not that critical, not that important. Um, sometimes gardeners themselves are, we're not really given our due either. And 
we're kind of seen sometimes as like well-meaning folks that like to, um, you know, have, a, have extra time on their hands and like to maybe play around with flowers. And well, although we may like to play around with flowers and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, um, I think that what we do is a heck of a lot more important. I believe that our gardens are essential to our health, our community, and the planet. And I think that we as gardeners play a very important role in helping make our communities happier and healthier and more life-giving. And I would like to invite everyone right now to give me a little bit of feedback on this, to chime in. Um, would you tell me, open up your chats and then just tell me in a few words, how does your garden help you? How does gardening make a difference in your life? It's earth therapy and it just, you can dig a hole and feel all your stress go out into the hole, not in you. Definitely. Absolutely. I heard somebody who is, I'm not sure which person that was talking. Let's see here. Admit. I'm going to try to look in here in the chat and see what, why am I not seeing the chat? Let's see here. Participants. We're seeing a lot of comments that it's a big stress relief. It helps the eco ecosystem for my garden and my generation and helps uh, the future pollinators. It gives me joy, brings peace, meditation, exercise, mental health and escape, happy and calming. It gives me joy when I drive past a garden and see all the bright colors and pollinators. <laughs> and I've been killing I my husband. I just love that one too. <laughs> ah, I love learning how to garden with my grandkids. It's very therapeutic, great for depression, makes me happy, brings joy and a sense of accomplishment and love watching all the, the critters. I love to see what attracts insects. That makes me happy, brings joy to the neighbors. Oh, I hope it brings joy to the neighbors. I'm sure it does. And we have, someone says, I have a pet pig and we sit and munch all day. Knowing and helping birds and butterflies, stress, exercise, bring, relieve stress and brings joy and peace. Some really good comments. I, I love seeing these comments and I feel the exact same way. And I really relate and I'm heartened to see all of these, um, these messages, these thoughts that you're sharing in the chat. So just as, you, just as your gardens bring you enjoyment and strengthen and heal you, um, as many of you have noted in the chat, they also have the ability to do that for others as well. And I want to talk specifically about a segment of the population of our community that has less opportunity um, and more need for gardens than ever. And I see that some of you have already talked about it and I'm talking about kids. And I'd like to talk about um, a little bit more about that. I'm gonna flip here now. So this is my middle son many years ago when he was little. I think this was his first day of preschool. And what is he doing? He is stopping to smell the chocolate daisies. And why is he doing this? Um, well, Look, look very closely. He is closing his eyes and he is smelling very deeply and enjoying their sweet smell. And why has he stopped there as he's all ready to go out on his first day of preschool? Because that's what mama did, right? Mama taught him to do that. And I wasn't even thinking about teaching him. He just watched me and he learned that's what you do. And many kids don't have anybody in their lives who teaches them to notice and appreciate plants. There's no one around who talks about them. There's no one who notices how fun or interesting they can be. Many parents and teachers are uninterested in plants and they're undereducated about gardening and nature in general. And unless children know somebody who feels differently, kids will naturally follow in their footsteps. 
This is a picture of my sons in our garden a few years later. I didn't have to work hard to get them out there. They just wandered out there on their own because it was interesting. Unfortunately, many kids don't have gardens of their own, nor are they given much freedom to explore gardens or wild places. They have school, they have a lot of homework sometimes, they have after school scheduled activities, and they have few chances to go out to discover nature on their own. Children need that opportunity they need nature to develop their minds and nurture their spirits. Just like us, they need gardens to help them slow down and to feel calm. They need an opportunity to learn how wonderful nature is. And how funny. And they need to know how much fun it can be to play in a garden. Just like us, kids also need a chance to connect to something beautiful, something bigger than themselves, something that gives them hope, something that they can care for. You know, kids are naturally self-absorbed. We all start off that way. Unfortunately, some of us end up that way too. But if we're lucky, our family and friends help us grow up and they help us learn to think about others. And gardens can do that too. They can open our eyes to all the other living creatures that we share this world with. Creatures that have needs like we do and they have value. Gardens can teach kids that they are not the only ones that matter, but that they, like all the other people and creatures out there, are important and they do have a place in our world. Gardens also give ch kids a chance to care for something. They can water a seed and watch it grow. They can fill up a bird bath and watch the birds come to splash in it. They can pull weeds. They can put down fresh mulch on a pathway. They can plant flowers and trees and see them uh, bring in butterflies and bees and hummingbirds. And by caring for gardens and wild animals, Children can realize that they are needed, that they are important, and that they are capable of helping and caring for others. These lessons are always important, um, but particularly now, while we are all stressed from our isolation and the threat of sickness, just as each of us need our gardens to unwind and to forget about our stresses and to bring some joy into our lives, kids need gardens and they need gardeners to invite them in and to teach them. If you are already one of the gardeners who brings your grandkids uh, or your neighbors into your garden, and I saw that some of you are because you noted that in the chat, thank you so much. And if you are one of the folks that feel that kids are honestly just too much trouble, because I know how that feels too, please reconsider. Think about all the little ways that you might be able to share your garden with children Maybe just inviting a few neighborhood kids to take a look at some of your flowers. Maybe offering them a chance to do a garden chore for a little pocket money. Um, there, there are also many schools that have gardens that they cannot keep up with or that they don't know how to take care of. Teachers are very um, overwhelmed by the number of activities that they are required to do to take care of students these days, even more so right now during the pandemic. And so you could be that person that makes it possible for that garden to be kept up, to be maintained so that teachers can bring their kids out there. However you can do it, however you can help children know to, to know and love gardens, please do because our kids are the future stewards of our planet. And we as gardeners have an opportunity to help instill in them the love and the knowledge that it's needed for this awesome responsibility. Okay, now on to the next topic. Why water is worth talking about. Water, you know, it's, it's something that we all need to live. Um, every aspect of our lives is touched by water. Everything we drink, we eat, we wear, we use in our homes. And yet, honestly, we hardly talk about it at all. Most of the time, we take it for granted. 
um, that we will always have the clean water we need when we need it. Um, in fact, we usually only stop to talk about water when we get too much or when we don't have enough, right? When, there's a, when it's flooding or when there's a drought. But beyond that, people don't think about it very much. And I wanna take an opportunity to think about water in North Texas for a little bit. Our state has the fast, one of the fastest growing populations in the nation. So right now, as you can see on this uh, chart, we've got close to 30 million residents here in Texas. And within 50 years, that's gonna be about 50 million. So the state agency that is tasked with making sure that we have secure water supplies for our entire um, population here is the Texas Water Development Board. And in order to plan for this, they divide up the state into different regions. And we are in region C, it's kind of that lightest yellow um, area up on the map. And so that includes Denton County, along with Dallas County and Tarrant and Collin and Wise and several others, 16 counties total. So within 50 years, the, the population in Region C in which we're in is projected to nearly double. Right now we're about 7.6 million. It's expected to be close to 15 million. And in Denton County specifically, within 50 years, um, planners estimate that our population in Denton County will be around 2.1 million. So with so many new people and businesses and industry headed this way, our water dem demands are gonna continue to rise. And yet our water supplies are not endless. This is a map of the major North Texas water suppliers. And this includes, you can see on this map, most of the the uh, counties that are in Region C. So here in North Texas, we depend almost entirely on surface water, okay, on lakes and reservoirs for our water supply. In Denton County, 90% um, of your drinking water uh, comes from reservoirs and lakes. In this map, you can see that uh, the, the different primary water suppliers. So the blue is Tarrant Regional Water District. That's the water district that I work for. And um, you can see the purple is Dallas Water Utilities. In the green, we've got North Texas Municipal Water District. And in the gray, the Upper Trinity Regional Water District in Denton County. So there are many, if you look more closely, you can see all of the different lakes and reservoirs that we're depending upon. So the, let's see here, I keep getting these buttons to show up. Sorry about that. There are many other smaller water suppliers um, that are in the region too. And depending where you live, like in Denton County, if you may be receiving your drinking water from the Upper Trinity Regional Water District, the Upper Trinity Regional Water District draws its water from Lake Ray Roberts and from Lake Louisville and Jim Chapman Lake. Um, if you're in the city of Denton, um, Denton is treating the water and it's drawing it from Lake Louisville and Ray Roberts. If you're in the city of Louisville, um, that city is drawing its water from Lake Louisville as well as um, sometimes the Dallas Water Utilities. So will the water in these lakes be enough to meet the demands of the growing population that we just talked about? No, it, it will not. It's, it's just uh, meeting the demands right now, essentially. And that is why all the water suppliers, these major water suppliers and all of the other smaller ones as well, are working on hundreds of long-term projects to increase our water supplies. Some of these projects, let's go here. Some of these projects are focused on minimizing water loss. In other cases, it's identifying and repairing leaks. Oh, there's a lot of old infrastructure that needs to be replaced. Um, water districts are also looking in, like TRWD is looking into aquifer storage and recovery so that we would treat water inject it back into the aquifer um, during times of plenty and then recover it in times of drought. There's also wetlands uh, water reuse projects like where we basically um, divert water from the Trinity River and then um, channel it through a series of wetlands in which it's filtered and cleaned and then used to recharge reservoirs. And then of course, there's an the option for new reservoirs as well. Um, such as the Lake Rife Ralph Hall. 
and that is uh, the upper Trinity Regional Water District has been working for years um, to obtain all the necessary permits and it just completed that process and should begin construction soon. Yet these projects, these kind of large infrastructure projects are extremely time consuming and expensive. It can take 15 to 30 years to, for all the planning and permitting necessary to build a new reservoir. And as you might expect, they cost billions of dollars and that raises the cost of our water substantially. And then you also, of course, we also have to keep in mind that any new reservoir is going to require the permanent loss of critical habitat. Um, that's wetlands, bottomland, hardwood forests, and agricultural lands. So our best choice to minimize the number of large-scale projects and all the economic costs and the environmental impacts that go along with them is to stretch our existing water supplies as much as possible. What's the best way to extend our supplies is to conserve what we have. The better we are at conserving, um, the more likely we are to meet everybody's needs and to delay and potentially even um, prevent um, the need for, for creating more reservoirs and other infrastructure projects. Let's think about um, water conservation for a moment. This is from the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and it kind of gives a breakdown for how we use water indoors. So you can see that there are definitely ways that we use more water um, in our homes, like where we want to really think about is like flushing the toilet, honestly, showering, the washing machine. Um, according to the EPA, the average household uses about 320 gallons of water per day. And there are lots of ways that we can reduce that um, that total amount and we can replace old toilets right with more efficient ones we can run full loads and washing machines and dishwashers we can you know set a shower timer and enforce that in our home um, there's even more opportunities to save outdoors so annually we spend about um, 40 percent of all of the water that we use in a year watering plants outside that's a lot right and of that amount about 50 percent is wasted due to evaporation and runoff. So this is a outside watering is one of the best ways that we can conserve water. There are many municipalities that are now using year round watering schedules in the city of Denton residents may only water between the hours of six in the evening and 10 in the morning between June and the end of September. However, they're encouraged to do so the entire year. In the city of Louisville, um, residents are also allowed to only water during those hours but um, they're also only allowed to water twice a week. Watering deeply and infrequently, no more than twice a week, is a really smart strategy for conserving water and it's effective. Um, and it helps our plants too, right? Because they develop um, deeper roots that are going to sustain them um, in times of drought. There's a number of other ways, of course, we can conserve water outdoors. You know primarily being water plants only when they need it, right? Um, you can sign up uh, for free weekly watering advice at watermyyard.org and they will send you weekly customized watering advice like only a quarter inch this week, only a half inch. Um, and you can also tailor that to, to, um, depending upon what specific sprinkler uh, heads you have. Um, you can also, of course, water more efficiently, you know, we can make sure that our sprinklers are working correctly and we can run several short cycles so that they have an opportunity to um, cycle and soak, right? So that it sprays the turf, the water can soak into our very hard soil sometimes. And then when it's softened, we can spray it again and, it's, and the ground can absorb that water. And then we're gonna prevent runoff into the streets. Um, there's a lot of water um, tips too, and do it yourself videos on uh, saveterrantwater.com. That's Tarrant Regional Water District's website. And you can find more tips and information too on waterisawesome.com. Of course, a great strategy is actually just reducing turf since we're spending most of the water actually watering turf. So if you don't need all the grass, right, um, you can prevent all the, you can save a lot of resources not only water, but also fertilizers, pesticides, energy and time, right, to mow that grass exactly, if you're reducing your turf to just what you need. And then of course, you can plant water-wise native plants. And that's my favorite strategy. Um, and that's why I'm excited that you invited me to come in today to talk to. 
So obviously using low water plants doesn't mean all cactuses and desert plants. There are some people who still think that though, but I know you as master gardeners have figured that out part. Um, and while part of Texas is extremely dry, right? We have an incredible diversity of ecoregions and plants to choose from here in, in Texas. And so um, if we could, I'd like to hear from people right now, for all those folks out there who, out there who already garden with native plants, um, would you please use the chat to tell everyone one or two of your favorite plants? I see Turk's cap, Salvia gregii, Greg's mist flower, Henry Duelberg. Yep. Oh, inland sea oats. Yes. As my friend calls it, endless sea oats. I like that one too. Oh, is Xmenia. Excellent. Fall aster, blackfoot daisy. Excellent. Flame acanthus. Yeah, the hummingbirds have been really thick on the flame acanthus lately. Copper Canyon daisy, all sorts of native grasses. Oh, I know, it is hard to pick one. Hey, okay, we're gonna talk about that one. I saw one that's a little more unusual. The frost wheat there, four nerve, yes, and the four nerve daisy. Okay, so if you are, if you're new to gardening in Texas, or just new to working gardening with Texas natives, pay close attention to this list, like save this chat, because this is like the, the superstars, right? The very popular loved, well loved ornamentals. Why? Because they have incredibly long bloom times. They're super hardy and dependable. Um, they use very little water. Um, they're, they're just fabulous plants and they definitely deserve a place in your garden if you have um, if you have enough sun or the right conditions for them so they're they're fabulous so these plants that we're talking about most of these plants that I'm seeing that you guys mention up here um, are generally pretty well known and I, I thought that it might be more um, interesting to talk about some plants that are not as well known um, that you might not be as familiar with so I know that probably there's a fair number of native plant gurus who are watching this and every single plant I'm going to put out there, you're going to say, I've got it in my yard. And if that is you, would you please email me afterwards? Cause I love to, to know who all of the native plant gurus are, but if you're, but my hope is that I might be able to introduce one or two new plants to you today, um, or give you some information about them, um, that you weren't uh, familiar with already. Okay, I'm gonna minimize the chat. Yes, and we'll talk about how to save the chats afterward too. I just saw that comment. All right, so the plants that I'd like to talk about today are native to the, um, let me see if I can fast forward here today. Yes, these are remarkable plants that are native to North Central Texas. And what's our ecoregion here? We're, we're in woodlands and prairies, right? Pr primarily. And so these are plants that have lived here in North Central Texas for hundreds and thousands of years. And they figured out how to thrive in our soils, how to survive our droughts and floods, and they've developed strong ties to all the wild neighbors. What am I, what kind of wild neighbors am I talking about? Well, I could have filled, you know, an entire slide with, you know, so many different beautiful creatures. I just put a few on there just to give you an idea of it. And some of them there might be kind of hidden. I don't know if you can tell in that bottom picture, there's a number of moths and bees and everything and they're all over that, um, that white mist flower. So these plants, the, the plants that are native to North Central Texas, they depend on animal pollinators to produce the seed to reproduce, right? And in turn, the, they provide food and shelter for all of these animals. They grow the tasty leaves, they provide the nectar and the pollen, and they produce the seeds just at the right time that they need them, right? So all the small insects that feed on these plants, like the caterpillars and the tiny little wasps and the flies, they can provide food for a multitude of birds and frogs and lizards and mammals, all of these wonderful animals and creatures that call North Texas home. So it's really important to think about these plants as the foundation of our local ecosystem. 
And being so, they are incredibly important and they provide so many ecosystem services to us. So when we plant these native plants, we're not only creating beautiful gardens and landscapes, but we are actually helping to restore our natural ecosystem and all the diversity of life that it supports. So let's see, I'm gonna flip back one more second. I saw, I was doing some research ahead of, um, before this and I saw that on the Denton, Denton County Master Gardener website, you have a wonderful slide presentation on the benefits of native plants. And so if you haven't checked that out already, please do so because there's a lot of great information in there um, on you know, just a, a diversity of native plants and things that we won't be able to talk about today too. So do check that out. All right, so I'm gonna focus on some plants that I specifically have seen growing in the parks. So this is something kind of fun that I like to do. You know, it's one thing to go to the nursery or the, to the store and see, oh, you know, they say that this is native. They say it's native to North Texas. Okay, yeah, sure, I've never seen it, right? <laughs> and so I think it's really fun to head out into the wild places, into the parklands, and into remnants of woodlands and prairies and try to find as many plants as I can. And so I have included wherever possible pictures of these plants growing in their natural habitat. And I'll tell you a little bit about where I found them and then my experience growing them uh, in a cultivated garden. And then we'll talk a little bit about their growth habits and in which um, types of gardens they would be best suited for. So this is um, a lovely ground cover um, that would be perfect for part shade and shady areas. Um, it's called golden groundsel. I have found two different species locally. Um, I found the only place, I live in Grapevine, and so um, the only place where I'd found it so far is a new park that we have. It's called Settlers Park. It's over there by like um, a Great Wolf Lodge and all those hotels and stuff that are back over there behind the mall. And this, um, this little ground cover is growing in extremely dry, sandy soil um, in post oak woodland. And um, it's, it's perfectly beautiful ground cover. And in the spring, it is covered in these little yellow daisies. Um, and they just shoot up on like stalks that are about a foot, foot and a half high. But the rest of the year, it's this evergreen ground cover. And you see that little picture up in the corner. That's a picture from my garden. And that's what it looks like the rest of the year. And this plant can actually grow in full sun and it can grow in deep shade. Um, but, you know, it's got its happy spot right there in the part shade where it's going to be. And it, I have... I do not have to water this plant hardly at all. In fact, the only plants that I've, this ground cover, the only time I've ever even really had to water it um, is the plants, is during the middle of the summer for the plants that were in full sun. The rest of the time, the plants were fine and lovely and they all bloomed just beautifully in the spring for me. And it's, they're a very early spring bloomer. So pigeon berry or Avena humilis is another favorite of mine. And this is also make a lovely ground cover in part shade or shade. Um, this plant is really fun because it only gets, it can get relatively high. I think in some, like if you give it something to kind of vine on a little bit, otherwise it's just going to kind of flop over on the ground. Um, I have this, I've seen this plant growing in Decatur in post oak woods there, and it was about two feet high. And I've also, this, these are plants of it growing, or these are pictures of it growing in my garden. And I love the fact that it puts on flowers and berries at the exact same time. And so the flowers are um, kind of a light pinkish and white and the berries are loved by wildlife. And I have seen mockingbirds come and eat these berries. Um, and this plant is relatively easy to propagate. Um, it would make a lovely addition if you need a shade plant. Purple leather flower, Clematis picheri. This is our, one of our native clematises. And this picture on the left is a picture taken from Par Park and Grapevine. And it's the only place where I've seen this plant growing. And it is, and I'm sure it's around here in larger places, but I just, you know, it's the only place I've seen so far here. And um, it's growing on, again, a sandy dry slope. And it's kind of tucked in with a bunch of other plants. And you wouldn't even notice it, right? Because it's not a very aggressive vine. It's not going to be one that's going to take over your fence, okay? This is one that you could sneak in there uh, with maybe some of your other vining plants. And you would absolutely be delighted at the little flowers that it produces. They're very long lasting. They have these thick, dark purple leathery leaves. And the insides are um, like a crimson red, dark purple with little yellow stamens. So they're very lovely. It would be, it would be a a great addition for your garden, something interesting and fun. 
blue mist flower. Many of you guys are familiar with Greg's mist flower, right? Um, this blue mist flower is our um, local mist flower, Conoclinium colostinum. And this picture on the left um, is this plant growing in its native habitat um, right there next, it's in a riparian area. Um, it's a very dry, sandy soil right there on the slope. And the picture that's kind of on the bottom, you can, that's also um, growing wild. So the, two, the picture on the top and the picture on the far right where it's much fuller are where I've planted it in my garden. I took it from, I took cuttings uh, from a local park and I started them in my garden. And within one season they had, you know, grown and full of that. It was just lovely and lush. Now, normally this plant you'll find growing it in um, dappled shade, part shade. Um, it's not rarely in full sun, but I, the, where I've seen it growing, um, naturally, it's in usually a more sandy loam. Where I planted it in my garden, I had a bit heavier soil, um, and I planted it in full sun. So that's why we're seeing this like immense, you know, like covered in blooms kind of thing. It's the flowers are very similar to Greg's Miss Flower, um, but the foliage is different. The leaves are not as finely lobed, and they're a bit darker green. So just like Miss Flower, it is going to spread. Um, so. I don't know if you can totally see it here, but I've planted it in an area where it's hedged in by a, a flagstone uh, path because I wanted to, you know, keep it contained and just let it be lush and beautiful in that space. So definitely just plan to have, you know, like all the mist flowers, plan to give them its own plenty of space so it can grow and look beautiful. And of course, draw in multitudes of butterflies. I've seen the monarchs and many other butterflies on it. Frostweed. I said somebody put this in the chat. I'm so glad that you did. This is Verbicina virginica. So this plant on the left is a plant I took growing in a garden in uh, a park in Keller. Um, I find it, it throughout the parks here. It's usually it's um, in kind of loose, sandier soil, and uh, but it can grow in a. It'll tolerate a wide variety of soils. Um, the plants that I have are growing in a little bit heavier uh, clay loam. They get to be about anywhere between five and you know six uh, feet tall, and if they're um, planted where they get at least part sun, then they're going to have some fabulous blooms on them. And as you can see in this picture, they're extremely popular with monarchs. And I will tell you that um, one of the beautiful um, places that I, most beautiful places that I saw frostweed was growing in a garden in Denton. And I went on a garden tour up there and I was so thrilled. And she had a huge um, area in her garden devoted to it. I would say it was probably like six feet by six feet. And it was super tall and lush and covered in monarchs. So the, um, the plant itself um, gets its name from these ribbons of ice that form when it first freezes. So water will exude from the stems and it will um, form these de very delicate, interesting ice sculptures. So that's something else fun to look out for. Coral berry. So this picture on the left is taken from a park. Um, this is not cultivated, so you can, this is, it's very common in post oak woods. It will, um, it's a lovely kind of graceful foliage. Um, as long as it gets good, um, air circulation. The leaves um, are a lovely like light green. They're kind of soft and feathery. Um, the, it will spread uh, with rhizomes and so you definitely want to put it into like a space where you would, where you would like that plant to spread. Um, it's not hard to control though either if you want to put it in an area like next to a turf space where you're just going to mow over any runners that come up. It's not, you know, terribly aggressive, but if you would like it to spread out like under some a post oak trees, it will do so. Um, that's its natural habitat. And it puts on these lovely berries um, in the late fall and winter that of course the birds love. I know American Beauty Berry is very popular. And many people know it, but I just had to throw it in in case we have some people that are new to um, to native gardens, or excuse me, native Texas plants. And um, I also wanted to note that a lot of times people don't recognize how prevalent it is um, in our in our um, North Texas ecosystem, in our woodland ecosystem. So about this time of year, if you take a walk on any sort of woodland trail, you're probably gonna see beautyberry. And these pictures that are here, they're, they're pictures, they're not from my garden, they're pictures that were taken out in the woodland. So that tells you that this plant is super prepared to survive and thrive and look gorgeous on existing rainfall and native soils alone.
So it's extremely popular with um, like over 40 species of birds. People, you can actually, for those who like um, and enjoy edible um, landscaping, this is a lovely plant. I know that there's a lot of recipes out there for making jellies and teas and jams with the berries. I'm supposed to kind of taste like a little bit spicy, kind of mild hibiscus flavor. So I haven't tried it yet, but I've been intrigued. Um, so this is definitely a gorgeous understory shrub uh, for, sh and it will take a full sun even, but it's going to require a lot more moisture. It's definitely going to look most beautiful in a part shade or dappled shade setting. Again, coral honeysuckle is one that you have probably seen in the nurseries and you're familiar with, but you might, if you don't go walking the trails regularly, you might not see it in our parks, uh, but it is growing up in the understory perfectly like fine existing on our, you know, with existing rainfall and on our native soils. And I see it, this picture on the left is from a park um, where it was growing beautifully. And I'm always thrilled when I see it in the parks. And I think people must think, oh, it got planted there. And they don't know that it's really just growing their native. Um, the picture on the right is from a coral honeysuckle um, that I planted in my garden. And um, something that I think that's really funny, in addition to, or beautiful, is that in addition to drawing in um, hummingbirds, this plant is a host plant for uh, many different uh, species of moths and one of them is the great leopard moth and those are the ones that look like woolly bears where they have like the black kind of fur and the orange stripes and they turn into beautiful white moths with black spots all over them and and they're really fun all right this is one that people might not be as familiar with um late flowering bone set eupatorium serotinum so this is one of our wilder flowers and um it's a late fall bloomer and this is here on the left, it's, um, this is a picture that I took out at um, Metamere Park. And on the right is a picture that I have it growing in a kind of contained area in my garden. I do expect that, I know this plant is going to colonize with rhizomes. Um, if you go out and to see it in spaces, you're going to see vast expanses of it and it looks absolutely gorgeous and it smells delightful and you'll see tons of pollinators on it um, especially monarchs this time of year because it's a it's a great fall bloomer um, but definitely use this plant knowing that it's going to spread and thinking about that ahead of time so that you can uh, plan for it Pete, somebody mentioned four nerve daisy. I had to throw this in here. It's absolutely one of my favorites. Now this, unlike the other plants we've been talking about, we started off talking about a lot of woodland and shady plants. This plant is gonna want your full sun and this is gonna want sandy, rocky soil and it does not wanna be babied. Where I have it growing, um, this, this picture is not from that spot, actually, um, but where I have it growing is in like that hell strip, right? And it's right next to the driveway and it's right next to the street and it doesn't get watered at all and it's perfectly happy and, and lovely and it loves all the heat. So this is one of my favorites. I also wanna um, note that this plant will bloom year round. So um, this plant, it's not uncommon to see this plant blooming in December. So super pretty. I'm surprised sometimes that I don't see this plant more often like on lists of extremely popular plants. I have had great success with Berlandier sundrops um, and I have used it in so many different garden settings. Um, this plant is also going to prefer that a drier, rockier, sandy soil. Um, it does not need to be babied. Um, it just needs good sun. Um, and it does not want, uh, it does need good drainage, right? Just like uh, some of those other plants that are appropriate for rock gardens. So, but I have, I have been completely impressed. In fact, I would, I, I hardly ever design a garden um, for a school or any place else without including Berlandier sundrops. So it's the, the bloom time is so long and the blooms are so thick and such a pretty lemon yellow, such a nice contrast with everything. So highly recommend this one. This is a fun prairie plant. So we're moving now, as you can tell, we've started off more shade plants. We're moving to more sun plants here. So this is a, a very happy uh, North Texas prairie plant. It's called um, Tall Blazing Star, Liatris aspera. And I, this is a picture of it growing in my garden. And I was thrilled um, to see how tall it got. Um, and of course, I, because I planted it in a bit richer soils. And so it did start to lean over and I had to stake it. And so I would recommend that this um, plant be planted in the, uh, towards the back of a garden, maybe alongside some um, taller grasses to give it some structural support. Um, and also don't baby it, definitely. Don't amend the soil a lot, um, you know, understand that it's a prairie plant and it's going to do perfectly fine 
um, with existing soils and rainfall and you're not going to need to baby it. So the butterflies, of course, loved these fuzzy purple flowers and I've seen a lot of insect pollinators on them as well. But I think it's a pretty striking, remarkable plant. Also prairie penstemon. This is a picture of some penstemon that was taken at uh, Tandy Hills Park in Fort Worth. Um, this is also going to um, enjoy like the, the drier, rockier soils. Um, it can be relatively, you know, heavier in clay. And it has a pretty long bloom time in the spring and gorgeous large flowers. Like you're gonna be surprised at how big these are. Um, and it's gonna draw in some very big pollinators. The um, plant forms a rosette the rest of the year. So after it's done blooming, you can cut off the stalk and it just has a little rosette and you won't, you know, you can tuck it in and let other things take over until the next year. So this is a spring bloomer too. We have so many different milkweeds that we could uh, draw attention to. I was gonna put some more slides in definitely for butterfly weed and antelope horns. Um, I've had a lot of success though with green milkweed um, in gardens. I find it's, it's very polite, unlike some milkweeds, you know, it's not going to send out its rhizomes and kind of take over the world. Um, but it will continue to bloom and come back. And these flowers are just gorgeous. Them so unique, these little clusters, right? And this kind of pearly iridescent white um, blossoms. And of course, uh, we all, as everyone knows, the host plant for the monarch butterfly and the queen and you, the whole host of all of the different insects that come in to feast on the milkweed plants will be present. Purple passion vine. Okay, so this is our native passion vine. We see passion vine a lot of times at the, at the big box stores and things. Usually it's like the, the five-lobed variety from Asia. Um, I'd heard at one point that the native one was not as aggressive, and I would like to tell you that that's not true. Um, that it, let's, let's use a different word though. Let's just say bold. The purple fashion vine is a bold plant and it can be found uh, growing all along uh, the lakes around in this area. And it likes that moist, uh, sandier soil. But honestly, I have been growing it in um, a much drier sandy loam and it hasn't minded at all. Um, it's taken off and covered um, a trellis that I have in one season. And, and what I was really delighted about, not only these beautiful flowers, but the fruit. So I'd always read that you could eat the may pop. Um, and so when I see this plant growing in the wild, I would always try to collect the fruit and I would miss it. I would like come back and it would always be gone. The animals would beat me to it. So I was really um, delighted to find that the fruit is um, super delicious. It it's, uh, smells and tastes like a mixture of apricots and bananas and oranges. This plant though is going to send out rhizomes. You have to put this plant in place where you're gonna either mow over the runners or some or a more like natural area where you are not, you want it to basically cover an entire fence or whatever, you know, cover over the, the shed or, you know, whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, it is a bold grower though, but it, it does bring in um, butterflies. It's also the host plant for the um, Gulf fritillary and other species of butterfly. So I saw on your, on that slideshow with the Denton County Master Gardeners, they had included false indigo. And I thought that was really fun. I have, I've only found this plant in a couple places growing in the wild and they were both very different looking. One was a sandy slope next to a creek and where it was doing a great job holding the bank in. And the other place was much heavier clay soil, uh, completely dry and um, far distance from any water body. And uh, in both instances, the plant was very healthy and bloomed and was you know, producing copious amounts of seed. These blooms are super cool, this dark kind of purpley magenta color with these yellow stamens. So it's, it's really lovely. It'd be a great plant. Um, it's a very large plant though. So expect it to get like 12 feet high and, you know, five, six, no, probably more like 10 feet wide. So it'd be a definite, a uh, great plant if you need um, like a background filler around a, a pond area. It will prefer moisture. And the last one I want to talk about is buttonbush. Um, this plant is also very prevalent all around of our lakes. If you go into any wild area, you can see it. Um, it does a great job stabilizing and holding in the banks. Um, these little white globes uh, will, will be filled with pollinators. Each tiny, each globe is full of, you know, dozens and dozens of tiny white flowers. And so um, in the springtime, uh, well, it's actually more like early summer, when it's covered in these white globes, the plant is practically humming. And that's a lot of fun. Um, but in the fall, these globes turn rust colored 
and then they're super decorative just the same. These plants on the pictures that I have on the bottom too, that, that is button bush growing in a cultivated garden. So, and you can see how tall it's gotten. Um, and the person who was growing it as a friend of mine, and she hasn't had any problems with the plant colonizing or sending up um, runners in the area. So she's been really, really pleased with it. So I, where can you find these plants? Um, for those of you that are new to working to gardening with native plants, I would definitely check in with the Trinity Forks chapter of the T Texas Native Plant Society. Um, they can point you in the right direction as far as local plant sales that may be occurring. Um, I know that uh, there are some giveaways for Painted Flower Farm and um, Painted Flower Farm has many of these plants um, for sale. And I love Painted Flower Farm, it's one of my favorite places to shop. There's also, if you can't find what you need, there's also online nurseries that sell a lot of these plants by seed. Um, I recommend checking out Native American Seed and Prairie Moon Nursery. And of course, you could always just contact me and see if you're, if you happen to be um, in the area, um, I would love to share some of the plants that I have with you as well. So I would love if you guys want to learn more about um, water conservation techniques or just uh, stay connected, we send out a monthly newsletter and you could sign up at saveterrantwater.com. And I will ask for your help, please, in raising awareness about water. You know, if you see um, neighbors or friends that are doing things that are wasteful, um, don't hesitate to speak gently to them. You know, a lot of times people are not malicious, right? They just don't know. And so if people respond well, if you're, if people, if you're gentle and just ask them about things or ask them to do something differently and explain why. And if you feel too nervous to take that on, I know at least in the city of Denton and, and Louisville too, they have numbers where you can call and people, somebody from the cities will actually call and contact those neighbors and, and help them figure out how they cannot waste as much water, right? So if you see that water running down the street um, or you see them blowing all of their leaves into the, you know, after cutting their yard or whatever, um, just think about how you could maybe help make a difference in protect, conserving our water and protecting water quality. And then the last thing I wanted to say is just, um, you know, all those pictures that I showed you at the beginning. Um, well, those were all pictures of my children when they were young. And sometimes, not always though, small children who love, who learn to love gardens and nature grow up to be big kids who love to love, love gardens and who love nature. Yay. And that's the point, right? We all, we need that. So please help me in this effort. Oh, thank you, Betsy. Thank you so much. Um, we'll look through and see. We got a few questions. You said folks were welcome to come see your garden, but where do you live? What general area do you, do you live in Fort Worth or? I live in Grapevine okay. and okay. Um, I have a, I have a garden in, I have to tell you, I didn't mean so much at my home because my, I have a garden in, pro, in uh, what is it, in progress. Um, this is one of the advantages of the, um, of our current situation, right? Is that um, I've been at home a lot more and I've had a lot more opportunity to focus in on fixing things in my home. So I'm still working on um, a whole new re-landscaping the whole front of my house uh, with native perennials most of my time and where i'd love to take you if you want to contact me um i spend my time at school gardens helping create um, native plant gardens and outdoor learning centers and then in our parks finding uh wild plants um that would be um ideal and beneficial to grow in a cultivated setting excellent oh well definitely have to send you a note to find out where some of those school gardens are if, and if they're in our area, we can, can, uh, can perhaps visit them. Um, I, we did have one question on if you're spreading wildflower seeds, um, what is a realistic time to, to, to spread those? Absolutely. Um, so the fall is one of the best times, right? Because if you're going to be spreading them, um, because you want the plants to have an opportunity to, to um, experience a colder, wetter temperatures. And so if you're, so if these are wildflower seeds that you're broadcasting, the fall is ideal time for that. You also want to think about when is that plant normally setting seed, right? 
Um, when does that plant bloom? When would it normally drop seed? If you're going to be cultivating your plants or propagating your plants at home though, um, a more reliable way might be to cold stratify them in your fridge. And this is what I've had a lot more luck with when I bought plants or when I've obtained seed. Mm -hmm. um, so you can um, fill, get some like builder sand. And I would not, I would hesitate to go to get this out of the sandy space in, in the ground because it's going to have a lot of extra microorganisms and plant seeds and things like that there. But if you get some uh, relatively clean builder sand, moisten it, and then put your seeds inside it, and then put it in a little Ziploc in your fridge for um, at least six weeks and then periodically just open the bag to give it some oxygen. Um, and then you'll probably have really great success um, propagating the plant that way. Oh, thank you very much. Um, at our on-site event, when we've had that the past few years, we've given away wildflower seeds and we actually keep them refrigerated <laughs> before we put them together to give out to attendees. And I hope in the future we can do that again. We've had great success with the Justin Seeds. Yes. Texas, Oklahoma mix that we have uh, utilized. So we appreciate that. Excellent. Um, so we've had a lot of good comments talking about different plants today. And as Catherine pointed out, you can click on three dots there at the bottom of the comments to the right and you can save the comments. And that way, if you want to go back through and make notes from the comments of some of the plants we talked about, you can do so. Um, uh, we, so we come to the end of our talk and I'll let me share my screen here. Thank you all for the very nice comments I'm seeing in the chat. I appreciate it so much. Oh, uh, thank you, Betsy. We're so glad you've come today. And thank you to all our attendees. We have our poll of where do folks uh, are live. And, and once again, we have a great group from Denton, so that's great. <laughs> We'd love to see you at our events, and if you want to become a Denton County Master Gardener, you can um, go to our website, and you can um, download information there, an application. We're currently taking applications for the class of 2021, and this is good. We have uh, many outlets for the information that we share, so we're seeing that y'all follow us and found information on Facebook, on uh, DCMGA's website, and you have gardening friends that told you about it. That's great. Look for us on Instagram, and you can go to our website and subscribe for our newsletter, where we also talk about upcoming information and events. So, um, and if I can close that. Woo, I was trying to go backwards. We try it again. Sorry about that. Uh, from beginning. So uh, if you want more information, you can visit uh, Betsy's, uh, uh, the website that uh, she's promoting to is the TRWD, which is easy. If you, your name has been uh, shown on the screen, you'll receive information from DCMGA communications for your uh, information on how to receive it. So our painted flower farm gift certificates go to Debbie S, Becky C, and Lisa C. And I've selected these based on numbers and a random number generator. And our rain barrel giveaway, I'll contact you um, and uh, figure out how to deliver <laughs> a, a great rain barrel for you to set up for Anitha R, uh, Lisa L, and for Carol B. Congratulations. Yay. Thank you for attending. Uh, if you have any more gardening questions that come up, you can always go visit our website and contact our help desk or the master gardeners in your own county and their help desk. And your talk was awesome. Uh, appreciate the information on native plants. I know the Native Plant Society is also putting putting together talks to celebrate, I think it's their 40th year, and that's a free event. So if anyone's interested in attending uh, that event online, then please visit their website. And uh, thank you again, and thank you very much to our attendees. We're excited that you all would come today, and we're very happy to share horticultural education with North Texans and North Texas gardeners. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sherry. All right. Goodbye.